Well, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Michaela Medina. I am a graduate student in the lab of Daniel Grochon at Scripps Research. Um, I'd like to say thank you to the Dazzle organizers for um, allowing me to present my work here today. Um, the title of my talk is 3D Surface Morphometrics Toolkit to Characterize Organelle Ultrastructure. Um, but actually, before I get into my work, um, I would like to share a little bit about my academic journey so far. Um, I always think it's really interesting to see uh, how people um, have found their journey uh, to science. So um, we are starting off uh, at a, a local community college um, and at here in San Diego, and that's primarily because I knew I was interested in biology, but um, I was, wasn't was exactly sure. And so actually I uh, changed my major um, or, or my focus quite a few times um, and even dabbled into physics a little bit. Um, and and this allowed me the freedom to be able to explore different avenues. Um, but finally, after a few years, I decided I wanted to go into cell biology and I was able to um, apply to UCSD uh, under the biology department uh, for cell biology and biochemistry. Um, this was the very first day I accepted the offer to UCSD and had to go to Price Center to take this photo. Um, but during my time here, I actually realized that even though cell biology is, you know, narrowing it down a little bit, it's still quite a large field. And so I didn't actually know what I wanted to do. I didn't have much um, actual practical research experience either. And it wasn't until my, uh, you know, winter quarter of my final year at UCSD in my undergrad that I took a 3D cryo-electron microscopy course taught by Professor Elizabeth Via here at, at uh, UCSD. Um, and through not only discussions in class, but also, um, you know, asking her about her, her work and, and what it's like to do structural biology and, and to do cryo-EM and cryo-ET, um, I was really kind of have this newfound direction of, of going into um, structural biology. But um, at the end of my time at UCSD, I wanted to take a break, uh, or not directly go into a PhD program, but I wanted to go get some real life um, research experience and see if this field was something I was really interested in um, and could do. So I then reached out to a professor at, at Salk, so just across the street, um, where I began a research assistant position um, doing structural biology, um, and this really allowed me to develop the technical skills that actually I found incredibly valuable um, during my uh, a PhD. So I was able to, you know, learn how to do electron microscopy, learn uh, the basics of model building, protein purification, all of that cool stuff. Um, and also found that I really enjoyed doing science on the day to day, um, which is important. <laughs> That's something you should know. Um, so. After spending a little bit over two years there, I finally made my decision to apply for a graduate program um, in which uh, I landed at Scripps Research. So it's an incredible place to be. Um, and this is where I'm currently at uh, in the lab of Danielle Grochon. Um, I realized I don't have many pictures of me doing lab things because I have a lot of pictures of samples and microscopes and all these other things, but um, I found one of me and uh, a fellow graduate student doing some dry lab um, computational work. So by the thumbs up, we are happy. <laughs> um, but it's interesting whenever I do, uh, see these because whenever I see these uh, maps of people's journeys, it, it's usually, you know, a, a, a map of the US or even a global map. Um, but my map really spans uh, only about 20, 20 miles in distance. <laughs> um, and so the biggest question that I get is, you never left San Diego. What, what how, how could you do that? Um, and I've, I've left, I've been on a plane before, but never for, for my career um, have I taken a position elsewhere. And really, um, that's because I, I'm a two body situation. I have a, an incredibly supportive husband who's um, kind of locked into Southern California. And I've grown up here. I really enjoy it. We have a, a life here. 
Um, and I kind of also lucked out because um, on the right, we have a map showing all of the EM facilities in the Western United States. Um, and what you can see is Southern California has like a, a healthy, healthy chunk of people doing cryo EM and, um, and obviously instrumentation that goes along with that, which is really important in our field. Um, and even if we zoom in a little bit more, uh, San Diego itself, and even the Mesa is a, is a big cryo EM hub. Um, we have all these institutions, San Bernam, Scripps, Salk, um, UCSD, uh, La Jolla Institute of Allergy and Immunology, and even some um, really cool, cool work is being done in, in uh, industry as well. So I, as I tell people, I haven't been to every institute yet on the Mesa. <laughs> um, and obviously navigating academia with a limited geographical range can present some cons. Um, so the biggest one is, is, you know, a valid one is that I'm, I haven't explored um, different academic environments and, and met new people, um, but I really try and make an effort to, um, you know, go do workshops and, and talk to people and foster collaborations that are, that are outside. Um, to try and kind of combat that uh, not remaining stagnant in one place. Um, additionally, there is a stigma. Um, I'm always asked, you know, why don't you broaden your horizons? Why don't you do all this? And, and um, sometimes it's it's not looked at uh, in the best light, uh, but I'm just like, really enjoy it here. And, and I explain my situation and most, most times people understand. Um, the biggest one, I think, in my future is I, I really would like to have an academic position and stay in academia, um, but due to how difficult it is to get these kind of faculty positions, um, limiting my range is, is going to be a, a tricky thing to navigate. So I, I hope to somehow make that work. Um, but on a happier note, <laughs> there are some pros. Um, so I keep very close contact with a lot of the mentors that I have, um, you know, met along my journey and, and I speak with them frequently and, and get their advice on how to navigate academia, as well as, you know, have really cool scientific discussions. Um, and these two are kind of related in that because I have been a part of so many institutions across the Mesa, I it's a little bit easier for me to find collaborations across institutions and I'm familiar with certain resources at different institutions because I've used a lot of these core facilities or I'm familiar with people who have equipment. Um, so that has come in handy um, quite a lot, um, which is, is really nice. Um, on a more personal note, um, I have my family here. Um, so my parents, uh, my husband, as I mentioned earlier, and, you know, the idea of, of starting a family, um, it, I know it's really speaking with people who, uh, faculty who have children, it, it, it's quite difficult uh, to kind of balance having an incredibly competitive lab and, and having that environment, but also having, um, you know, a family. And so having additional help by my parents would also um, facilitate me being more successful in my job. Um, so, and also their incredible support. Um, and the, you know, uh, the advertised uh, tourism uh, attention grabber for San Diego is the nice weather. And uh, I just had to put in a, a picture of uh, Mission Bay that I took, um, which is, you know, this incredible sunset with a double rainbow. And yeah, I have, where do I get that other than here? <laughs> um, all right, so shifting gears back to uh, my research, um, and again, we're interested in understanding um, organelle ultrastructure um, and, and how do we define that? And, and so we've developed a, a toolkit to be able to do this. And so in the lab, um, in the Grotron lab, we're really interested in mitochondria, mitochondria and mitochondrial dynamics. Um, and so the mitochondria itself, I'm sure this group needs no introduction, but um, you know, I've drawn it here with its outer membrane and its inner membrane and these highly specialized specialized folds called cristae, and I've drawn it as the canonical kidney bean shape. And this is how a lot of people think about it. 
Um, and so what I think is not always appreciated is that actually mitochondria are incredibly dynamic and display a wide range of, of morphologies. And so these networks can actually change through a process called fusion from these kind of tubular, um, you know, some, some of these mitochondria are tubes and some of them are a little bit more spherical, but there's a good mix. Um, and you can actually have these push more towards highly elongated and interconnected networks through joining of mitochondria or a process called fusion, as well as, um, you know, having highly fragmented populations, so very punctate mitochondria, um, through a process called fission or the division of mitochondria. It's a lot of really incredible work has been done, uh, decades and decades and decades of work has been done uh, understanding mitochondrial dynamics with plate microscopy. And we've gained a lot of knowledge, um, but one thing that we don't understand is how does the inner, inner workings of a mitochondria, and so the inner membranes, how are they oriented in this, in this type of, um, during, these more, during these changes? Um, and due to the resolution of light microscopy, uh, we have to turn to a different modality. And so in our lab, where we think we could complement a lot of this light microscopy work is through the use of cellular cryoelectron tomography, or cryoET, in which we can visualize cells uh, with uh, an incredible amount of detail. So here I'm showing a 2D slice of a three-dimensional volume, because um, we actually image in, in three dimensions. But here we can identify mitochondria, uh, a mitochondrion based on its, you know, characteristic double membrane, and we see cristae here. We additionally see surrounding ER, and um, you know these little spots here are actually uh, uh, cytosolic ribosomes. And so, as I mentioned before, our data is three D in nature, and so what we have to do is actually take uh, our data and segment out or isolate out these membranes and attribute them to uh, you know the outer mitochondrial membrane the inner mitochondrial membrane um, and so here this is a movie showing us uh, in, in uh, a program called the Mira doing this and so we have the purple representing the outer membrane the green representing the inner mitochondrial membrane and we could do this with any other membrane um, in the cell and so here we're showing also ER um, shown in yellow. So the biggest challenge historically is how do we begin to attribute significant changes in, in organelle ultrastructure um, when no two organelles look alike, um, you know, they can have a wide range of morphologies. Um, and so then we started thinking about different components that we would want to measure. And so some things for in the instance of a mitochondrion, we may want to think about intracristate distances. So how far apart are these each little leaflets of um, the cristae? Membrane curvature. So how curved are these membranes? Um, cristae junctions. How are they spaced? How are they organized? Um, inner and outer membrane distances and really any other distance measurement, including outside of the mitochondrion. So how close is the ER to the mitochondria as well? I think these are all really important things that we, we want to be able to understand. And so we can do some of this um, in two dimensions. And so I've, I've made a cartoon here showing a mitochondrion with the cristae, um, so the inner membrane in pink, the outer membrane in uh, purple, and the ER in blue. So if you wanted to make a simple distance calculation of how how close are these two organelles interacting? Well, we can qualitatively see that that is the region that is closest um, in distance. And so if we could pull, pull up our data in something like ImageJ or um, uh, Amira, which is another, another way we can make distance measurements. And we could say, okay, we've identified by eye that these two, and you know, we can do a couple of trial and errors of you know, which distances are indeed closest. And so we could say these two are the dis two points in which these uh, two membranes are the closest. Um, but as I've stated before, we're in three dimensions. And so we have a problem in which we have, um, this is the 2D slice that we currently identified as the closest distance. But actually, we can have many different 2D slices. 
And sometimes the closest distance aren't even on the same 2D slice. And you could be able to identify these um, through very careful analysis in a multi-viewer to try and get that specific um, like right view to measure these distances. But again, this is incredibly time consuming um, and doesn't lend itself to automation. Um, and also because of the amount of user uh, interaction and user determined um, uh, points, it can lead to be a little bit less precise. So our goal is to try and automate this process. But one challenge is that the way we are representing our data in those vox in those segmentations that I showed before in those models is that we have voxel segmentations. And we think about this as uh, voxels are three dimensional pixels. And so we can think about this as the, the video game Minecraft, or you basically just have building blocks on top of each other. But there's no encoded geometry. There's no way for like one block to necessarily inherently encode geometry, geometry to another block. Um, so what we actually have to do is change our surfaces into a polygon mesh, which is more like what every other video game uses shown here by a cartoon or a video game of, or an animation of Mario. And so what we have are now these triangle meshes that we can now have uh, oriented in certain orientations that fit the surface. So we have orientation and they're directly related to each other by each of these um, uh, vertices and uh, and sides. So now we have a way to direct directly represent geometry. So we follow a pretty standard or a pretty traditional segmentation workflow in which we have our tomograms, we isolate out these membranes in a binarized uh, fashion, and then we get our voxel segmentations. We can now, uh, what we've, we've done in the lab um, is convert these into, po into point clouds, which is just a different way of representing um, the data. We can now estimate normals and perform a screened Poisson mesh. And that's just, uh, I think of it as an analogy of just putting a cloth over our data and how does this cloth accurately represent these surfaces? And then we can mask back our mesh or keeping with this cloth analogy, we just trim the excess of where our data is not. And so what we end up are these final surface generations um, in this new uh, uh, triangulated mesh. And just to kind of give you a, a peek at um, our, our progress, this is uh, an inner membrane of a mitochondrion shown and reconstructed through, through pi curve, which was the state of the art surface reconstruction. And we can see there are quite a few areas in which we, we see a lot of shreddy membranes or there's not a ton of information there. But with our new uh, method of surface generation, what you can see is a lot of these areas where there were holes are now nicely filled in. Um, and we're not, you know, adding anything that isn't there. It's just it's weakened signal that was not picked up accurately. And so we can now have a robust way to generate these surfaces a really complex um, topology. So now we have all these cool surface membranes, like what can we do with them? So back to this list that we were interested in of all these measurements. So now we can, we've uh, implemented a curvature analysis in which we can um, identify local changes in curvature. Um, and so here we have a mitochondrion inner membrane um, displayed as a heat map. And so we have lower degrees of curvature, flatter regions displayed in blue, and we have uh, higher degrees of curvature displayed in red, which are mainly the cristae junctions, which makes sense. We can also do things like orientation. So how orthogonal or how like upright are cristae in, in um, relation to the outer membrane. And we can also look at different distance measurements. So if we think about my cartoon before about how we have you know trying to do different distance measurements um we can now do this with way way less user intervention um and way more precision 
Um, and we can do this instead of what would have taken someone probably days to weeks to try and get estimations. We can now do this in a matter of hours um, for many tens of, of examples of, of surfaces. So this is really cool. And really where I see this going, this, this work is, is a way to integrate and contextualize a wealth of data that we have in the literature and, and a lot of the work that our uh, neighboring institutions are doing, um, looking at uh, functional assays, so, uh, like respiration assays, uh, proteomics data, so understanding protein changes within a mitochondria, and how does that affect, um, you know, its, its uh, ultra structure. Lipidomics data, we know that lipid composition is really important um, and, you know, and, and it's dynamic. And so you can have changes in lipid composition. Well, how does that affect curvature or, or a membrane's propensity to be more curved or less curved? Um, and so I've really shown this in our proof of concept of, of mitochondria, but um, you can really apply this to any organelle. Uh, we've done a little bit, although not as extensively, on ER. Um, but you can apply it to multivesicular bodies, ER, Golgi, anything that you could segment out as a membrane, um, which is really, really cool and quite powerful. And so in the same way that on the atomic level, we have, you know, structure equals function, and the structure function relationship is really important and is a guiding, um, you know, concept in, in structural biology. We want to now, on the organelle level, have ultrastructure function relationship. And so now we can use this as a tool to analyze organelle structure in disease models. So having different disease states um, and seeing how their organelles respond or change or even just basally look. Um, also, if you're interested in organelle, organelle interaction, these are important things that people have been studying by light microscopy. We can now be um, have a little bit more detail and be more quantitative about it. Um, also, organelle structure in response to different stimuli or different uh, phases of cell cycle um, could be also really interesting as well. So we really see this as a kind of a, a, a tool that opens up really to any biological question you want involving membranes. Um, and with that, um, I would like to thank um, my lab for the uh, tremendous amount of support and guidance through um, all of my time in, in my uh, PhD, but also uh, for the work, specifically Ben Barad, who is uh, my co-first author on all of this work that I showed today, um, and uh, the Wiseman Lab, who we collaborate at with Scripps as well. Um, and with that, I can take any questions, and thank you so much.